Hello, this lecture covers rain loads. Rain loads compared to other loads that we design a structure for are usually fairly simple to calculate. Um, everything is challenging the first time you do it, however, so let's take a few minutes and, uh, and look at the issue. Rain loads are covered in chapter three of Tally, section 3.6. Uh, it starts off talking about roof drainage, but then that chapter goes on and talks about the calculation of rain loads Chapter three of Fenella is where you'll find rain loads and it's in section 3.3. In ASCE 7-16, rain loads are covered in chapter eight and in the International Building Code, they're covered in section 16.11. The general philosophy when it comes to rain loads is to avoid them if possible. Water's heavy, so if you can keep it from accumulating on the roof, then that uh, is generally the best option. Okay, um, so the idea is if you can use a sloped roof so the water can't accumulate. Here's an example of a building with a sloped roof uh, with a roof designed like this, and this looks to be like maybe a 312 pitch, then there's no possibility for rain water to accumulate on this roof, so there's no need to design for a rain load. Okay, when you can't avoid uh, water accumulating on the roof, when you have to use a flat roof, then you use a roof drainage system. You provide a primary drainage system to keep water off. You provide a secondary drainage system in case the primary drainage system gets clogged up or fails in some way. And then you design for the weight of the water that accumulates on the roof between the primary system and the secondary drainage system. Okay, the image in this slide shows a typical flat roof system. Uh, regrettably, I don't remember which web page I grabbed this from, so I don't have a reference for it. But you can see the, uh, the system uh, shown here. The roof is flat, and we have parapet walls on all four sides. So the primary means of drainage on this roof are these scuppers on the far side and the near side. So the, uh, the water would presumably be uh, draining out of those two scuppers. And the other scuppers that are shown here are going to be secondary drainage systems, these four locations there. So the idea is that if something were to clog up the primary scuppers, then the water would rise a little bit to get to the elevation of the secondary scuppers. And that would uh, leave uh, some static water on the, bridge, on the uh, roof, and you would design for the weight of that water that had accumulated between the primary scuppers and the secondary scuppers. Okay, this is an anatomy of a roof. Um, in this case, you can see the, uh, the roof boards covered with felt or asphalt uh, paper, and then finally the uh, bituminous uh, uh, membrane that's gonna provide the water, uh, water barrier there. Um, so in this case, the uh, um, scupper that's shown here at the bottom is the primary drainage system. Uh, water flows through that scupper into the hopper and then down the downpipe. As a secondary uh, uh, system here, the uh, uh, secondary drainage system is going to be basically overtopping of the wall. Basically, the, if the primary system gets clogged, then the water will accumulate until it just runs over the top of the wall, overtopping. This is what a scupper looks like from inside looking out. So you can see in the foreground, you can see the gravel that uh, represents the ballast and the UV protection for the, uh, the roofing. And then you can see through the opening where the water would run. Okay, here's some uh, additional images. This one I did have a reference for, um, shows different options. So in the upper uh, left is the idea where you have the uh, scuppers. So in that system there, um, the primary drainage would be the scuppers that are leading to the, uh, the downpipes and the hoppers on the outside wall. Secondary drainage system there would be overtopping of the, uh, the parapet wall itself. In the upper right, instead of uh, uh, providing a, a slope towards the exterior walls, the, the roof is actually sloped towards the center. And there is a drain there that would drain the water down through a pipe into the uh, uh, ceiling space below and then somehow get it out of the building. And then uh, secondary drainage in that system would again be overtopping of the, uh, the parapet wall. In the uh, uh, bottom image, the lower right, there's uh, parapet walls on three sides of the building, but not on the fourth side. And so the roof is arranged so that it slopes down towards that open end 
And in that case, there is no need for secondary drainage because it's not really conceivable that uh, the entire open end of that building would become clogged up and uh, would lead to any accumulation of water. Okay, when we talk about roofs, the uh, slope is generally given as an amount of rise per foot of run. So if you say I've got a, a one inch uh, per foot run, that means that for every uh, foot of uh, uh, horizontal distance, you end up with one inch of vertical change in height. So if you're talking about a house, <clears throat> Excuse me, if you're talking about a house or residential structure, it's not uncommon to refer to the slope of a roof as a, uh, 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 say, a 12-12 pitch. A 12-12 means you have 12 inches of rise for every 12 inches of run, um, and that would be a 45-degree angle. You could have a 5-12 pitch or a 3-12 pitch or whatever. When you talk about uh, commercial buildings, steel buildings, uh, concrete buildings, then you talk about the amount of rise per foot. So uh, one inch per foot, uh, two inches per foot, or uh, more commonly, you would use something that's uh, very small, like a quarter of an inch per foot. And we would refer to that as being flat. Even though it's not technically flat, it's close enough to being flat that we do refer to it as being flat. The design codes don't specify what the slope has to be for any given roof. All that they require is that roofs be designed with enough slope so that they can assure, uh, so that you can assure that the water is going to drain properly, either drain off the edge of the roof or drain to some sort of a drain or a scupper. Generally, a quarter of an inch per foot is considered to be the minimum, uh, the minimum slope. Okay, deflection considerations are pretty important for roofs. Um, if uh, you design your roof members to be uh, uh, completely linear uh, and then uh, erect the building and the roof members deflect, then rainwater is going to accumulate in that deflected shape and that's going to be problematic. So typically what you do is you would camber the roof members upwards so that when the uh, dead load is applied, they deflect into a, a straight line. You can't really say flat because flat implies that it's horizontal and that's not what we're after, but it does have to be a straight line. Okay, here are a couple examples of interior roof drains. Um, uh, basically the same example shown twice, I suppose. Uh, put a cage over them to keep uh, larger debris out. Um, and then uh, there's a weir uh, that's around most of them to control the flow rate of water through there. So they typically open up and have a, a drain pipe at the bottom and then that drain pipe goes into the typically one drain is Typically one drain is required for every 10,000 square feet of roof area. And you can actually see the slope in this uh, particular roof. Um, if you look closely, you can see that the roof is sloped down towards that drain in all four directions. Okay, here's another uh, photo showing the roof drain and a weir. There's a little bit of water that's accumulated around here, but uh, that's certainly not enough to be concerned with. And this is what that roof drain might look like on the underside of the building. So you can see the opening in the metal decking. Um, you can see that there's uh, some sort of uh, black, probably plastic uh, um, uh, shroud that goes around the drain. And then the pipe comes down through it and it's insulated to uh, provide for thermal protection because um, rainwater and meltwater will be flowing through that in the winter. And you wouldn't want that to affect the uh, uh, the heating and the uh, 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 heating costs in the winter or the cooling costs in the summer. Okay, this is what we're guarding against by having a primary drain system and a secondary drain system. If the primary drain system becomes clogged like this, um, then uh, that could lead to an accumulation of water. And if you don't account for that with a secondary system, the weight of the water could quite quickly become large enough that it could lead to a collapse of the roof of the structure. This would be basically worst case. Uh, it's hard to tell how deep the water is here. Hopefully it's not too deep. But uh, in this case, it looks to me like the uh, primary means of uh, uh, getting rid of the water is by running off the end of the uh, building back here. But anyways, we're trying to avoid the accumulation of water on the structure.
This is a typical big box type of uh, retail store. This is a Dick's Sporting Goods. It's not too far from my house. What you can see is that there's a large marquee on the front of the building and there's a parapet on the front of the building that is stepped down uh, depending on where you're at. If we look at the same building from the back side, and we can do that because there happens to be a gas station there uh, behind this building up on a rise, what you can see is that we have parapets uh, on the sides of the building here and over here. Here's the marquee from the front and you can see that the parapet uh, on the front of the building is over uh, like that. One of the things to notice is that there isn't much of a parapet on the front of the building relative to the sides, at least here in the back. And the reason, reason why is that the front of the building, uh, the roof is at a higher elevation than it is at the rear of the building. And that's because the roof slopes towards the rear of the building like this, probably at a rate of a quarter of an inch per foot or maybe, uh, maybe a half an inch per foot so that the rainwater will run off of the building from front to back. And then you can see here, these are gutters that are along the back edge of the building. And um, then that water flows into these downspouts. So in this particular case, primary drainage would be through the gutters and into the downspouts. If that happens to fail and clog up, then the water just runs over the downspouts. I'm sorry, runs over the gutters and then discharges onto the pavement. So there wouldn't be any rain load to design for. And here's a closer up view of the one side of the building. And here you can see the, uh, the gutter here on the back edge of the structure and then the downspout here. And that gives you an indication of the height of the, uh, height of the parapet as well. So you can see the parapet has some height here, just uh, guessing that that's on the order of, I don't know, maybe uh, uh, two to three feet. But when you get to the front of the building, um, that same, uh, parapet elevation at the top only provides uh, an exposed parapet of about two or three inches. Here's another building near my house. This is a smaller box store, Walgreens uh, Pharmacy. And from the ground level, it looks like this uh, has a, a flat roof. Um, but if we take a look from the air, if we take a look at the roof from the air, and I've used Google Maps here in order to get this image, I wasn't able to fly up there myself, you can get an indication of uh, what the roof looks like from above. And it's uh, hard to see, but hopefully if you look closely, you can see that there is some positive parapet height here at the back of the store, but at the top that parapet uh, uh, exposure gets a lot smaller. Um, and that reason for that is because there's actually a slope to this roof from the front of the building back to the back. And the reason for that, the reason for that slope is that the um, primary means of water drainage is out through these scuppers on the back edge of the building. And then it goes into the hoppers at the top and then down through these uh, downspouts and into the sewer system. So for this particular building, I don't see any roof drains on the, the actual roof itself. The only drainage that I see would be the scuppers. So primary drainage in that case would be through the scuppers and into the downspouts, but you would have to design for the possibility of those scuppers becoming clogged. And then secondary drainage would be overtopping of the parapet. So in this case, uh, you would design for a static head, D sub S equal to the full height of that exposed parapet on the back edge of that building. This is another building in the uh, Fairfield, Ohio area. Um, and this is the senior high school. And what I'm going to focus on is this uh, arena area over here. It's actually the primary gymnasium or the arena where the basketball team plays and the uh, volleyball team plays, etc. And so this uh, has a sloped roof. So rainwater would run off of the roof in either of these two directions, uh, depending on whether it falls on one side of the uh, peak or the other. And if we look at the arena from the ground level, you can see the slope and the roof here. And the primary uh, drainage is uh, into the gutter and then down through these downspouts. One night I was there after a basketball game, however, and it was raining, raining pretty hard. And I noticed that there was actually a, a bit of pressure built up in the uh, downspouts. 
In fact, if we look at a video here, you can actually see water pouring out. And in this uh, uh, video that's showing on the right, you can see the water is streaming out here pretty aggressively. And that indicates that there's a fair amount of pressure in that downspout, which would indicate that that is plugged someplace. And that is precisely the reason why we have to design for the amount of water that accumulates between the primary and the secondary drainage systems. Now, in this case, uh, secondary drainage, uh, since the roof is sloped out towards the edges, would just be overtopping of the gutter. Um, so not a big deal in this case, but this is uh, an interesting example where we have visual evidence of the primary drainage system being plugged. So you guys probably recognize this, though it might have been a while since you've uh, seen it. This is the roof over the interior portion of Rhodes Hall. So underneath this roof system is the uh, the high bay on the left, and on the right would be the auditorium uh, classroom, uh, what is it, 544 Baldwin Hall. What I want to do is zoom in a little bit more closely on part of the, uh, the roof area. I want to zoom in on um, this drain here or one that's like it. And... And when we zoom in on that, you can see that there's both a primary drain and a secondary drain that are arranged quite close to each other. So the one that's closest to us, this one right here, is the primary drain. And it's the one that's going to be used um, almost in all cases, except when it gets clogged, then this drain here would be the secondary drain. And then this is a different building, but it, uh, this is a, a light metal building that's under construction. And what you can see here is the drainage system that would be underneath um, those two drains uh, or something would be like those two drains. So what you can look up and see are these PVC pipes. And you can see this would be one drainage system here that's coming down like that. And you can see behind it is the second drainage system that's leading off in the other direction. Now, the idea is that you don't want to have just two separate drains, but you have to have two completely independent, completely redundant drainage systems. It doesn't matter if it gets clogged up at the roof level or if it gets clogged up when the water is discharging into the sewer system. A clog at any point in the drainage system could be catastrophic for the, uh, the integrity of the roof. So the, the systems have to be completely independent from one another. This is an example of a local big box store, uh, local here in the Cincinnati area. And uh, looking up in this store, I noticed that the what appears to be a primary and secondary drainage, at least from inside the building, both go into the, the same downspout. So if we look here on the left, we have one drain there that is going into the same drain as this other uh, over here on the left. And it looks like they both outlet into the same downspout. Same thing here in a different location within the same store. If these truly are primary and secondary drainage, then this wouldn't meet the spirit of current uh, design standards. Um, but uh, to be fair, I can't see the roof of this structure and the, uh, the, the images that I have on Google Maps don't give enough uh, resolution to know whether that's really two uh, uh, different drains, a primary drain and a secondary drain, or whether that's actually two primary drains that are draining into the same system. This is another example. This is actually taken from the YMCA in uh, this one's up in Bridgewater, up in Liberty Township. And there are two drains that are coming through the roof here close to each other. Now, I couldn't get a, a, a photo from of the drains from above, but uh, um, they probably look just like those bird cage bird cages that I showed a couple of slides ago. So two different drain systems here. And um, so here's drain system number one comes down that pipe. Drain system number two comes down and goes out that pipe. And on the next slide, we'll look at a different perspective. So a different perspective of the same system. So this is the primary drain, I suppose, here going down and then through this uh, or next to the column and probably goes into the drainage system for the uh, building. Uh, drains into the sewer system. And then this one, I suspect, is a secondary drain. And you can see it discharges into this pipe here and it's already feeding from that direction. So there must be another drain um, back uh, out of the image. And it goes here through this wall. And in the next slide, 
you can see the outside view of that wall. So as a secondary drain system, the water is going to run out of that uh, opening and then discharge into the uh, off to the side of the building. So illustration of two completely independent, completely redundant drainage systems. Finally, one more uh, illustration before we dive into some calculations. Uh, this is the Tangeman University Center on the University of Cincinnati campus. Many of you are probably familiar with this structure. If we look over here to the left of the main entrance, you'll see a, an outflow. And if we zoom in on that a little bit, here it is again to the left of the main entrance. You can see that that is actually a discharge for rainwater that uh, uh, is being collected by um, some drains that are likely located somewhere on the roof level. So if you walk over there during a rainstorm, you should see uh, water pouring out of that if it is a primary drain <laughs> or uh, if it's a secondary drain and the primary drain system is, uh, is clogged. Okay, so how do we go about calculating rain loads when we need to? Well, uh, when buildings are configured uh, such that the potential exists for rainwater to accumulate, they have to be uh, designed for two independent drainage systems, a primary and a secondary. The secondary drainage system is in place in case the first one becomes plugged or inoperational. And when that happens, water is gonna rise above the primary drain until it reaches the elevation of the secondary drain. And the rain load that we designed for R is basically the weight of the water that accumulates, assuming that the primary roof drain is plugged and the water has to get to the elevation of the secondary drain. So this is the equation we use for calculating the rain load. It's taken as 5.2 times quantity D sub S plus D sub H. D sub S is the static head. It's the depth of the water on the undeflected roof up to the inlet of the secondary drainage system. D sub H is the hydraulic head. It's the depth of the water on the undeflected roof uh, above the inlet of the secondary drainage system. So basically in order for water to run uh, over the top of a parapet, it has to have some depth while it's doing that. Um, in order, you know, it's a hydraulic head. Okay, in order to get the equation, bear in mind that uh, the, the unit weight of water is 62.4 pounds per cubic foot. And if we convert from uh, inches squared to feet squared, then what you end up with is a constant 5.2. So 5.2 in that equation is actually in units of pounds per square foot per inch. So that uh, reminds me that the, the units on that equation are in pounds per square foot. And if you're working in SI units, there's a different version of the equation. All right, now this illustrates the idea of two redundant drainage systems. So you have a primary drain that's uh, shown here, a secondary drain that's shown uh, here, and uh, the depth of the static head is the depth be, uh, between the primary drain and the secondary drain, and then the depth of the hydraulic head uh, shown here is the level that the water has to rise above the secondary drain uh, while it's flowing at a constant rate. Here's a second illustration that shows basically the same thing, except in this case, you have a primary roof drain, but the secondary drainage system is basically a scupper on the parapet of the uh, building. So the, pri uh, the, uh, the static head, D sub S, is the change in elevation between the lowest part of the scupper and the primary roof drain. And the hydraulic head, D sub H, is the elevation of the water as it would be flowing at a steady state through the secondary drainage system. Okay, there are a couple different kinds of scuppers. There's an open scupper or a channel scupper that's shown here. And you can see that the uh, uh, value of D sub H, the hydraulic head, is illustrated there. And then there's also a closed scupper um, that uh, is basically an opening in the wall, but it's not an opening that extends to the uh, full height of the parapet wall. And in this case, the hydraulic head can actually be larger than the opening height H of the scupper. So D sub H in the case on the right, in the case of the closed scupper, is actually larger than the value H. Okay, now you might remember when we defined D sub S and D sub H, we used the phrase undeflected roof. And that means that we don't consider deflections of the roof members when we calculate the depth of the water. 
Um, you might be inclined to say, okay, I have a unit load, uh, uniformly distributed load due to the rain uh, R. I can calculate the deflection of my member. What is it? WL to the uh, fourth over 384 EI or something like that. Um, and then figure out how deep the water is going to get. But what you end up with is a, a second order problem. Um, so we use the undeflected roof to uh, avoid complexities in our calculations. And if we were to account for that deflection, it would actually be a problem where the result depends on the input. So it would become iterative and it would become incredibly complex to solve. Now that brings up the idea of ponding. Uh, ponding is a problem that uh, you have to be aware of. Um, and it's a, a rather insidious problem because uh, if you don't have proper drainage on your roof, then the rainwater is going to cause the roof to deflect. And uh, that deflection is gonna lead to additional rainwater collecting, and that's gonna cause more uh, deflection on the roof, and that's gonna cause additional rainwater to collect, and it's gonna cause more deflection on the roof, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's gonna, uh, it's a, actually a, a good example of a differential equation, but uh, none of us like those, so I won't go into any detail there. All I want you to be aware of is that ponding is a second order problem that is uh, better to avoid than to tackle head on. Okay, now the dynamic head, the amount of height of the water as it flows into the secondary system is somewhat challenging to calculate and it varies widely depending on the type of secondary drainage system that's used. And in order to uh, uh, tackle this, in order to calculate D sub H, you're gonna need to have some coordination among the design team. You're gonna need to be uh, talking to your architectural engineer, your architect, uh, and even the, the plumbing coordinator for the for the team in order to determine what the uh, uh, the parameters of the secondary. In general, uh, D sub H depends on the type and size of the secondary drainage system and the flow rate that it must handle. The flow rate is given by the capital letter Q and it's calculated using this simple equation, uh, 0.0104 A times I. Now, A in this equation is the area of the roof that's tributary to uh, each one of the drains, and I is the rainfall rate, usually given in inches per hour. So if we wanted to figure out where that constant uh, comes from, you take 7.48 gallons per every cubic feet. Um, every hour has 60 minutes, and every foot has 12 inches, and when you do the math, you end up with, uh, um, you end up with that constant of 0 0.0. 104. Okay, now if we want to know about more about flow rates, we would uh, uh, be referred to Chapter 11 of the International Plumbing Code. Uh, it contains requirements for the roof drainage system, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Rainfall rates are available based on the geographic location of our structure, and the design values are taken from the National Weather Service, the National Ocean at Ocean at, <laughs> uh, NOAA, and then uh, in Washington D.C. Um, and basically, these are designed based on a 100-year rainfall, and we're looking at a one-hour event. The maps that we would refer to um, are found in the International Building Code, actually, but they're not found in ASCE 7. But uh, here they are, um, and you can see that these are basically like uh, topo maps, except that they're, uh, the values that are given are rainfall rates in inches per hour. So you can look at the uh, northwest, you got a one inch per hour rainfall there. Um, if you look at the uh, uh, like the Los Angeles, uh, San Francisco area, you got one and a half to two and a half inches of rain. If we look at the east coast, um, down around Miami, you got about four and a half inches of rain, etc. So what we can do is fly this in. And uh, New Orleans, I think, was the largest one I could find at 4.8 inches per hour. Um, Las Vegas was the lowest at 1.4 inches per hour. And then you can see all the other areas in between. So as a conservative case, you could design for five inches per hour and you probably got the worst case for the United States. In the state of Ohio, Cincinnati's rated at three inches per hour. Um, and then uh, Cleveland, Columbus, and Toledo are similar, 2.6 and 2.8. While the International Building Code and the International Plumbing Code require that drains be designed for a one-hour, 100-year rainfall, ASCE 7 has slightly different requirements. ASCE 7 requires that the primary drains be designed for a one-hour, 100-year rainfall, but the secondary drains be designed for a 15-minute, 100-year rainfall. 
Now the significance of that is important because the odds of it raining really, really hard for a 15 minute period are much higher than the odds of it raining really, really hard for a one hour period. So um, the best place that I can find to go for this rainfall data is the NOAA uh, database and the URL for that database is provided there. So if you navigate to that URL, you can determine the, or input the location for your design and then it brings up a table of data for different uh, rainfall durations, say 15 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour, whatever, and different uh, return intervals. So a 100 year rain, a 25 year rain, etc. If we look up the data for the Cincinnati area, what you'll find is that there's a, a one hour rainfall total of 2.71 inches and a 15 minute rainfall total of 1.40 inches. Now it might look like the 15 minute rainfall total is smaller and it really is, but it's not the total rainfall we're interested in, it's the rainfall rate. So when you look at the uh, rainfall rate for a 15 minute period, it actually correlates to 5.60 inches per hour, which is much higher than the one hour rainfall rate. All right, so if we're going to calculate the flow rate for our channel type scupper, this is the equation that we would, we would use. 2.9 times B, the width of the scupper, times D sub H uh, to the one and a half power. If we wanted to calculate the flow rate of the closed scupper, then there's a slightly more complicated equation shown there. So um, here, are, uh, here is a table that's in the commentary to ASCE7, and it gives us the flow rate of uh, these scuppers uh, in gallons per minute based on the dynamic head. So the values across the top, uh, one, two, two and a half, three, et cetera, that's the dynamic head that would be developed for these scuppers. And then the numbers in the table itself are flow rates. And this is a second table in the commentary to ASCE7 that gives flow rates for uh, pipe type or drain type uh, roof drainage systems. So we have a number of different parameters here. Uh, basically, what you're looking for is the drain outlet size. And based on that and the other parameters, then you can figure out what the dynamic head is going to be based on the flow rate that uh, uh, is needed. Okay, that brings us to the end of this lecture. Hopefully you now you have an understanding of how roof drainage systems work, how you can avoid rain loads by using sloped roofs, and how to calculate rain loads when you can't avoid them. All right, thanks. Okay, there's a couple of changes coming to rain loads in the next edition of ASCE7, the 2022 edition of ASCE7. And the biggest with respect to rain load is with respect to the equation. Instead of just designing for the static head and the hydraulic head associated with rain, we also have to design explicitly for the ponding head. And if we define these parameters, we have D sub S and D sub H that we're familiar with now. But we also have D sub P in our rain load calculations, and that's defined as the depth of the water caused by deflections of the roof subjected to unfactored rain load and unfactored dead loads. In other words, it's the, uh, the depth of the water attributable to ponding. Remember in uh, the 2016 edition of ASCE7, we had to consider ponding only in certain situations, but when we move to the next edition, we'll have to consider ponding in every situation. Another change coming in the 2022 edition of ASCE 7 deals with the definition of, of what we have to design for with respect to accumulated water. Um, not only do we have to assume that the primary drainage system is clogged, but we also, in some cases, have to assume that the secondary drainage is clogged. In the case where the secondary drainage system is only two inches higher than the primary drainage system or where the, they share the same drain lines as the primary drainage system.